Welcome to Bullet Point Nursing. My name is Dr. Goldstein, and in this series, we're going to go through essentially the entire nursing pharmacology curriculum. So whether you're here as a nurse, a nursing student, or a nurse practitioner student, you'll be able to find, hopefully, all the pharmacology knowledge that you need here. All the notes that we use in this lecture can be found at bulletpointnursing.com. So let's go ahead and let's start talking today about hematology and oncology in relation to medications. So let's begin with talking about chemotherapy. First of all, chemotherapeutics, let's define that. That is medications that are used to treat cancer. It's a subclass of all pharmaceuticals. It's pharmaceuticals that are specifically used to treat cancer. And let's first understand one key concept in treating cancer. And that is in any disease that we are taking care of. If we have a 99% success rate, usually that's a really good thing. The problem in cancer is that a 99% success rate kills off 99% of the cells. If 1% remains, we know that very often that 1% blows right back up to where we were, and that's what happens with, with uh, recurrence of cancer. So our goal is really to eradicate 100% of every single cancer cell in our body. However, that's really, really difficult. But to achieve that goal, we usually take a three-pronged approach. And when I say that, I mean that we have three options of how to attack cancer. And usually we use multiple options. We have surgery, we have cancer, uh, chemo, and we have radiation. Each of those are distinct methods of attack against cancerous cells. And often they're used in combination to ensure that we get rid of every last cancer cell so that the patient has permanent remission. So let's talk about some of the drugs that we're gonna to have to deal with when we deal with can uh, cancer patients. First of all, let me tell you this, for testing purposes, for NCLEX purposes, cancer drugs are really handled strictly by oncologists. This is never something that is dealt with in primary care or anywhere outside of an oncologist or an oncology floor. For that reason, we usually don't get too deep into the mechanism of action or other specifics of these drugs. But there are some broad things that the NCLEX or your uh, school's curriculum may want you to know about chemotherapeutics. First of all, some of these medications require special gloves to prevent the medication from affecting the nurse. Keep in mind, some of these medications are extremely powerful and extremely dangerous to a healthy patient. There's a subset of drugs that are used and these are not what we're discussing today, but they're called radioactive isotopes. These medications are also sometimes used to attack cancer. And we're not gonna get further into it than this today. I just wanna cover one point. When dealing with radioactive isotopes, these medications need very, very specialized gloves. They need specialized um, insulated uh, disposal mechanisms to prevent the medication from har uh, harming anyone else or the environment. So that's just one thing to note that radioactive isotopes have an extremely high level of hazardous uh, component to them. And for that, they need to be handled with extreme caution. There are some generalized side effects or adverse effects that apply almost universally to chemotherapeutics. I'm gonna cover them here so that we don't have to cover them individually with each specific medication. The first is teratogenicity. Almost all of the cancer medications that we are gonna discuss are teratogenic. So this means that the patient cannot be pregnant or trying to become pregnant. If they are, they're going to have a discussion with their provider on what's the risk versus benefit in terms of carrying the pregnancy or uh, getting the treatment that they need. Nausea and vomiting. The term emotogenic means how much something makes you nauseous. Chemotherapeutic agents have some of the highest emotogenicity out of any medication out there. The nausea that comes from this is beyond what most people will ever experience. For this reason, there's a few key things to know. First of all, pre-medicate your patient. And we cover this also in the nausea and vomiting lecture when we talk about GI, but I'm gonna cover it here again. Pre-medicate your patient. Obviously, we generally don't treat patients for things before they have that symptom. In this case, we do. Also, we have a much more expanded um, spectrum of medications to use for nausea related to chemo, such as cannabinoids, such as steroids, such as benzos, all three of those are used to treat chemo-related nausea, but are not otherwise used to treat nausea. Next, almost all the chemotherapeutics cause a decrease in our immune system. They're immunosuppressive. What does this mean? This means that a patient is at higher risk for infection. 
What would a test ask you, the NCLEX ask you? Well, these patients might need serial WBC um, labs drawn. They might need to keep getting their WBC check. They may need to wear a mask when going out in public, unrelated to COVID. They may need to wear a mask when going out in public. They may need to immediately report a fever to their provider because any sign of an infection is taken very seriously because they're immunosuppressed. So lots of things like this um, are what the test can ask you. And again, these, this applies to almost all the chemotherapeutic agents. Alopecia, where the patient loses their hair, this also, please educate your patient. Yes, this is more than likely going to happen as a side effect of their medication. This is reversible and their hair uh, growth will return after treatment. Let's go ahead and let's talk about a few specific drugs. And I really just want you to be a little bit familiar with these drugs, at least recognize what they are and what they're for. These are all for cancer, at least recognize the names. Other than the previous instructions that I just gave you related to the adverse effects, related to the safe handling, um, generally these medications are not gonna get too deep in any um, of your curriculum. Please also note, most patients that get chemotherapy, this is not a daily medication. This is every few days, once a week, every few weeks, something like that. It's not generally gonna be daily. Um, so just keep that in mind. So the first we have is alkylating agents. The drug here is cyclophosphamide and it interferes with DNA replication. Remember the big problem with cancer, with tumors, is that they replicate much, much faster than human cells. So for that reason, um, anything that interferes with DNA replication is gonna be a good thing to help with cancer. Um, I do say that they, interfer that they reproduce much more rapidly than human cells. Obviously, I should clarify that, depends on what type of cancer. Anti-metabolite or folic acid antagonist, depending which book you look at, which drug class they're gonna call this. However, the drug is methotrexate, and this actually is probably the most tested on cancer drug because it's not just a cancer drug. We use this drug to treat rheumatoid arthritis. We use this drug to induce abortions, more specifically um, when a patient has an ectopic pregnancy. To date, we're unable to transplant that into the uterus to, for, for viability, so we do abort that, most commonly using um, methotrexate. So this medication is seen quite a bit. How does it work? It blocks folic acid. Most of you probably already know that lots of pregnancy patients are recommended to take folic acid. Why? Because that's necessary for fetal growth. Obviously, if this is a folic acid blocker, a folic acid antagonist, that makes perfect sense about why it's teratogenic. It also makes sense about why it interferes with DNA synthesis. The next drug class we have is an anti-metabolite, and this medication is 5-FU. And this medication has a more complicated mechanism of action, but it interferes with a few different processes as well as RNA synthesis. And again, it's used for cancer. The next drug we have is doxorubicin. And again, this interferes with DNA and RNA synthesis. I assume you're sensing a pattern here. The next one is vincristin. Again, interferes with RNA, DNA, and protein synthesis. All of these medications are used almost exclusively to treat cancer. You would not need to know at the RN level which medication is meant for which cancer. You may be tested on, generally speaking, using chemotherapeutics in general, and the question may have a specific one in mind, so you do have to recognize it as a cancer medication. The next one uh, is a little bit more likely to be on an exam, and that's an anti-estrogen known as tamoxifen. This medication blocks estrogen receptors, and it's used for both the treatment and the prevention of breast cancer. So we do use this a little bit more than maybe some of the other medications. It does have two black box warnings. One is for thromboembolic events, aka blood clots, as well as endometrial cancer. Yes, I know it's used to treat one cancer and it gives you an increased risk of developing another cancer. That is correct. Thromboembolic events, that's a favorite of test questions because there's so many ways we can ask that. But just remember, think of all the different ways that we can, uh, that a, a, a thrombus can present, whether it's a PE, whether it's a DVT, and all those different ways are fair game for the test. The next medication is not a cancer drug, but it does relate to what we've been talking about. The drug class is a calcium neuron inhibitor, and the drug here is cyclosporin. Cyclosporin is an immunosuppressive agent. It suppresses their immune system, and it's really used for just two things. Number one, and more commonly, it's used to prevent organ rejection, so that we know when patients get transplants, sometimes our own body can attack the organ. This is meant to prevent that. It's also used for some autoimmune diseases. You should recognize a pattern because autoimmune diseases, again, means our own body, our immune system attacking us. 
This drug has a ton of side effects because it is so suppressive of the immune system and it's so powerful in what it does. It has so many different effects. It causes high blood pressure, increased risk of infection, the kidneys, the liver, cancer. It causes many different things. Obviously, a patient that's getting a transplant uh, is a pretty serious condition as it is. So it makes sense that some of these more powerful medications, even though it has all these adverse effects, it's still in the patient's best interest. This medication is probably one of the only times that it has too many black box warnings for me to list. I think it was at like six or seven. I just went ahead and put many different black box warnings. I will tell you the very first one is that this should only be given by professional providers that are experienced in using this specific drug. Again, because of how many adverse effects it is, you don't see that black box very often when you do take it seriously. Next, we're gonna move into a little bit of hematology. So the first drug we're gonna talk about here is EPOE and alpha. EPOE and alpha, what's its mechanism of action? It stimulates production of red blood cells. You know what else stimulates production of red blood cells? Erythropoietin. Now in our body, we all have erythropoietin. It's produced by the kidneys. So that's a good thing to know, and especially for test taking purposes, what patient might need this? An answer can be someone in kidney failure because if the kidneys are failing, they can't produce erythropoietin. If there's no erythropoietin, we don't have that stimulation uh, to produce red blood cells. What do we use this for? We use this for anemia where a patient doesn't have enough red blood cells. And I wanna be really clear. If a patient has acute anemia, we need to give them red blood cells. This doesn't give them red blood cells. This stimulates the body to produce red blood cells. This takes several weeks for it to have its full effect. It starts to take effect in days, but it takes several weeks to get its full effect. So keep in mind, for example, if I give this to a patient, I'm not gonna reassess for efficacy 12 hours later or two hours later or five days later. It's gonna take about two weeks before I can reassess the CBC and hope to see that increase in their H&H. &H. Um, also, this drug has a black box warning that it is uh, not to be given to a patient that is not anemic. If the patient's hemoglobin, is 11 or higher, remember normal hemoglobin is roughly 14 for females, 15 for males, roughly. If it's over 11, that means they're within the healthy ballpark, we do not give this drug. And think about it, this drug is gonna make you have more red blood cells. Well, we know red blood cells carry oxygen, so that should be great, the more the better. Except our blood is a very specific viscosity. We don't want it too watery, we don't want it too thick. If I give you a ton of red blood cells, the blood gets really thick, and then guess what's gonna happen? I heard it, awesome, it's gonna clot, you are correct. So if we give this patient, give this to a patient that doesn't need it, they have a increased risk of developing blood clots, it is definitely not meant to be used for that. Another thing, this medication is given parenterally only. Who is it given to? Anemia, for whatever reason, will we wanna stimulate red blood cells? Again, not acute anemia, don't let a test uh, trip you up on that. Acute anemia will be treated with PRBCs or packed red blood cells. The next drug we have is filgrastim. This medication works by increasing our neutrophils. Neutrophils are needed in order for the immune system to function properly to be able to fight off infection. So if a patient doesn't have enough neutrophils, this may be given to stimulate that production. Again, I'm not giving you neutrophils, I'm helping the body create neutrophils. What's the most common instance where we use this medication where someone's immunosuppressed because of the drugs we talked about, the chemotherapeutics. Remember we said almost all of those are immunosuppressive putting the patient at an increased risk of infection. This can help boost their immune system so that they no longer have that increased risk of infection. The main adverse effect of this medication is bone pain. Think about it. Where are blood cells produced? Awesome. Next, the next drug we're going to talk about is ferrous sulfate, also known as iron. What's the mechanism of action here? Well, we know that ferrous sulfate, iron, is the essential component of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin we know is what carries uh, oxygen in our blood. Without iron, we don't have hemoglobin. Without hemoglobin, we have no way to move oxygen around our body. What do we give this for? Obviously we give iron for iron deficiency anemia. The adverse effects of this medication, very, very infamous, certainly fair game for a test. In fact, I'd be surprised if you don't see it, and that is GI effects um, when given the PO route. I know this medication is available over the counter and I wanna make one quick point on that. This medication is available in a bunch of different strengths over the counter. They are not interchangeable. If a patient says, well, I'm taking the over the counter one, there is a very big difference between taking 65 or 325 or whatever it is. So you have to make sure you're very specific on what specific strength and concentration the patient's taking because that makes a big difference.
This medication is known to cause GI effects. Patients should be taking this on an empty stomach. They're not going to want to because they may have figured out that if I take it with food, I'm not going to have those GI effects. Well, guess what else? If you take it with food, it's not going to work as well. So that's counterproductive. We want you to take it on an empty stomach so that we get the full effects. Yes, you may get some adverse effects, most commonly constipation. For that reason, we should educate these patients on the steps to avoid constipation, such as increased fiber, increased fluid, and increased activity. Now, we do want to also be sure to take this medic, or sometimes want to take this medication with vitamin C containing juices, such as orange juice. Why? Because that's actually going to increase its effects. For example, if I want to give a patient iron, I can tell them, take a lower dose and take it with vitamin C. And that can actually be the equivalent of taking a little bit of a higher dose. The treatment for this is usually going to go on for about 30 to 60 days until the patient has their full um, iron uh, capacity back to normal. If the, uh, a patient's being treated for iron deficiency anemia, you should educate them that within a few days, they should already start to feel better if they were previously symptomatic. Let's go through a few patient education points. First of all, the dietary sources of iron, if a patient doesn't need supplements, if they just need to get more in their diet, would be meats, grains, fruits, vegetables, and fortified cereals. Vitamin C, we already said, can increase your absorption of iron. Educate your patient this can turn your stool black. Not bloody, but black, okay? Educate them so that they're not surprised or freaking out when they find that out. This medication also can cause fatal overdoses in children, so patients must be educated to keep this out of reach of children. Finally, you should probably know the different labs that we use to assess for a patient that has iron. Some of the most common ones we would assess is a CBC, an iron level, a ferritin level, and a TIBC. The last drug we're gonna talk about in this module is gonna be cyanocobalamin or vitamin B12. The mechanism of action here is that it's a required component for red blood cell creation as well as DNA synthesis. If a patient doesn't have B12, what do they have? They have megaloblastic anemia. If a patient has this anemia, we treat them with B12. Now there's two causes of a patient being B12 deficient. The first cause of being B12 deficient is diet related. Most famously, who would not have enough B12 in their diet? Vegans, strict vegans do not get B12 because all the sources of B12 are eggs, dairy, meat, things like that. However, nowadays we have a ton of foods that are plant-based that are specifically fortified with B12 to prevent this. Additionally, most people that go to a vegan diet are educated to make sure to take a B12 supplement. So that's one type of B12. If they come in deficient, we find out they're vegan, they haven't had any, we supplement, problem solved. The second type of B12, and the one that we're talking about with cyanocobalamin, is where the patient has what's called a lack of intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor, or IF, is required in our GI tract for our body to synthesize B12. So I could be eating a food that contains B12, eggs, meat, whatever, and it goes into my GI system, but I need that IF in order to process the B12. If I don't have IF, I could eat all of this food in the world, the body can't process it, and the body never gets any of it, it's like I never had it. So without intrinsic factor, IF, we can eat all the B12, but we would still be B12 deficient. In that case is when we use cyanocobalamin. Cyanocobalamin is available POIM sub-Q intranasal. We, the intranasal is relatively newer and we do use that sometimes for patients that need long-term treatment. However, for test purposes, IM, intramuscular, is gonna be our go-to method of giving cyanocobalamin to a patient who's B12 deficient. In a patient that's B12 deficient, we're gonna give them IM, IM injections. It's usually monthly, and it's usually for the rest of their life. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.